Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Katherine Fitzgerald Wyatt. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at the library. And before I introduce Brent Tarter, who I think probably every single person in this audience knows, I did just want to do a few housekeeping things. Um, one, which my colleague Ashley will will scold me if I don't tell you, is that there are comment cards on the table outside of the room. We would love um, your feedback on the program. We do use that um, to help us shape future programming at the library. So please fill that out and drop it in the green box on your way out. And I also wanted to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. Um, this Saturday from 10 to 2 here at the library, we have our transcribe anniversary. So if you're not familiar with our Making History program, um, you can come in and help us transcribe historic documents and then make them accessible. And I think it's the ninth year, um, um, don't quote me on that, but there'll be guest speakers, there'll be an opportunity to transcribe our World War II um, separation notices and it should be a, a really great event. You do have to register in advance. So go on our website if you wanna participate and then um, I hope you are aware that it's the library's 200th anniversary. So we've been doing a series of programming here and across the Commonwealth um, throughout 2023. We have a giant purple van um, that's named LVA On The Go, and we've been taking it all across the state. We will actually be local um, on September 30th. We'll be at Chesterfest. And so if you do plan on going to that event, please stop by and say hi. I will be there. Um, so let me know that you saw me here for Brent's talk. Um, for other upcoming events, please check our website, www.lva.virginia.gov. And I wanted to introduce Brent Tarter, who's a retired research historian and senior editor at the Library of Virginia. He was one of the founders of the library's Dictionary of Virginia Biography Project. He was a co-founder of the Virginia Forum, the annual Virginia History Conference. And he's the author, co-editor, um, or editor of 18 volumes on a number of topics in Virginia history, as well as numerous articles in scholarly and popular historical journals. His most recent books include The Grandees of Government, the Origins and Persistence of Undemocratic Politics in Virginia, which was published in 2013. Gerrymanders, How Redistricting Has Protected Slavery, White Supremacy, and Partisan Minorities in Virginia, 2019. Virginians and Their Histories, 2020, which is really a comprehensive history of Virginia that if you have not read, I would suggest that you pick up a copy. Um, in 2020, he also published with Mary Julian and Barbara Batson, the campaign for women's suffrage in Virginia and coming in the spring of 2024 with Mary Julian and John Deal, justice for ourselves, black Virginians claim their freedom after slavery. And I, I'm sure that we will get him back to do a, a talk for us when that comes out. Today, Brent's going to be discussing his book, Constitutional History of Virginia. And so please join me in welcoming Brent Tarter. Thank you for the invitation, for the introduction. And I thank you for coming out for a program on what too many people would think is just an arid and erudite subject, state constitutional history. Written constitutions are an American invention. It began at the time of the American Revolution. Many people look at the Constitution of the United States as the conclusion of the American Revolution when it institutionalized the changes that were brought about when the Americans kicked royalty out of their governments. People talk about the Constitution of the United States. They talk about the Bill of Rights even more, and they pretend that they know what those documents mean. But they never talk almost never talk about state constitutions. There's one U.S. constitution. There are 50 state constitutions, and most of those 50 states have had more than one constitution during their histories. Virginia has had seven state constitutions. It's had eight if you count a comprehensive revision that was ratified in 1928. 
Well, those constitutions tell us a lot. They're interesting. Their histories are interesting. They trace over a period of 400 years, beginning with the King James's charter to the Virginia Company of London in 1606. They trace over 400 years themes of continuity and change in Virginia's history. 10 years ago, when I published a book with the subtitle, The Origins and Persistence of Undemocratic Politics in Virginia, I used the voting provisions of the state constitutions as mileposts so that we could keep our step and keep track of the forward and backward movement in Virginia for extension of the suffrage to larger numbers of people. By the time I finished that, I thought, by golly, you know, one of these years, I'm going to try to write an entire constitutional history because there are many other very interesting things to be seen in the state constitutions. State constitutions are important in ways that we don't think about. State laws that are enacted under the authority of state constitutions and within the limitations that state constitutions impose are in many respects much more important to us than federal laws. State laws, state constitutions, enable us to rent or buy a dwelling place, to own and operate a motor vehicle, to have the protection of police and fire departments. State constitutions affect us in almost everything that you can think of. The state constitutions of Virginia have allowed some people to thrive and at the same time condemned other people to lifelong slavery. State constitutions and state laws determine what kind of public education our children and grandchildren can receive, if any. And at the most fundamental level of representative democracy, state constitutions determine who can vote and who cannot vote and among those who can vote, who they get to vote for. State constitutions are extremely important as telling us about the nature of our representative democracy and how that has changed over the decades. Nothing is constant, but it's always been, well, not always, it's been my view for about 30 or 40 years now that within Virginia, Consistency or continuity is the context in which the change takes place because changes are almost all incremental. They accumulate. Some of them dissipate. You know the old phrase, two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward and two steps back. The constitutions allow us to see this in a way that other kinds of historical inquiry usually don't. In large part, that's because other kinds of historical inquiry focus very deeply on one subject, maybe on one constitution or one constitutional convention or one election or one civil war. If you back up, you could see things in a broader perspective. One of my hobbies for many years has been bird watching. You know, you see us weirdos walking around all over the place with our binoculars trying to see something and get a good view of it. Your binoculars allow you to see detail and to focus on a narrow subject. But you've probably done this. I've, every child I've known has done this. I've taken the binoculars and turned them around. And the view is very different. Suddenly it's a very wide angle. Um, that's what I've tried to do here is to look at things closely and then step back and look at the very, very large context, this 400 years worth of history that takes place. And the constitutions help me, and I hope that the history will help you see some aspects of Virginia history fresh. For instance, we talk about the American Revolution in June of 1776, after all, when a Virginia convention drafted and put into effect the first written constitution for Virginia, which, by the way, I'm not bragging because I didn't have anything to do with it, but by the way, it happened to be the first written constitution anywhere. State constitutions were a part of that revolution. 
But if you look at the Constitution of 1776, it's extremely unrevolutionary. It is, in fact, a very, very conservative document. It eliminated royalty and the institutions that the king had created for the colonial government. It strengthened the institutions that Virginians had created and that the king allowed to exist, such as a bicameral general assembly, such as the parishes of the Church of England, were, which at that time were still part of the government. The government was a part of the church. And such as the undemocratic county courts that developed in the 1620s and 30s and those county courts consisted of, you know, 12, 15 justices of the peace in each county, and they selected the people who were going to take, who were going to fill vacancies on those courts. There was no election. They would send a list of names to the governor, and the governor would issue a commission that included those names. So the county courts became unelected little local oligarchies. No democracy there at all. In fact, there was no democracy anywhere in colonial Virginia. They limited voting to adult white men who owned or had a long-term lease on at least 100 acres of land, or 50 acres in a house, or a lot in the two cities of Williamsburg and Norfolk. So at any given time, maybe two-thirds of the adult white men in Virginia were eligible to vote at any given, any given election, maybe half to two thirds of those voted. And the only elected officials in Virginia were members of the House of Burgesses. They didn't change much in the Constitution of 1776. They created a new Senate of Virginia to be elected, didn't allow the election of anybody else, specifically retained the voting qualifications that had been in effect since 1736. And they replaced the royal courts and other royal institutions of administration with new ones and empowered the General Assembly to elect all of those officers, including all of the judges and including the governor. The office of the governor went from being a rather powerful one. The royal governor, after all, was the personal deputy of the king. The new governor that the General Assembly elected served a one-year term, could not be elected to more than three terms, and also had to operate with the advice and consent of what they call a privy council or council of state that acts kind of as a watchdog on the governor. The governor couldn't do very much. That was extremely obvious during the Revolutionary War, and it was extremely obvious during the War of 1812 when the governor's responsibilities required him to exercise authority he didn't have. So either the authority didn't get exercised and as, you know, as of, at the time of, uh, of the invasion of, of Richmond during the American Revolution, when the General Assembly fled to Charlottesville, Thomas Jefferson's term as governor ended. They didn't have a governor. They didn't have anybody to issue orders, order the militia here or there. Um, there were real failures there in having a two week governor Anyway, the Constitution of 1776, by and large, continued the institutions and practices of government and politics that the colonial Virginians had created, and that's it. There's a constitutional convention in 1830-31 that relaxed the property qualification a wee bit, not much, but a wee bit, and changed almost nothing else. That con constitution was in effect until 1851. So, in effect, for the first 75 years that Virginia was an independent state, it was still operating under the same general structure of government that had been around in the colonial period. In 1776, Virginians were in the lead amongst the states in writing a constitution and especially in writing the, the declaration, writing and adopting the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is also the first of its kind and an extraordinarily influential document. By 1850, the Virginians were lagging far behind every other state in the country, except, of course, South Carolina, in moving towards a democratic polity. During that 75 years, 
every other state, with one or two exceptions, abolished the property qualification for voting. Every other state allowed voters to elect most of the public officials, judges, governors, attorneys general, county officials like justices of the peace or county treasurer or uh, county clerk, but not in Virginia. Eventually, in the convention of 1850 and 51, Virginians caught up with most other Americans. They abolished the, the property qualification for voting. They allowed voters to elect governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, every single judge in the state, including justices of the peace, also sheriffs, tax collectors, constables, local officials of all kinds, so that you finally get a reasonable amount of democracy in Virginia for adult white men. In part, this is because of an inadvertent blunder that Thomas Jefferson and George Mason made way back in 1776. You remember the language of the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, endowed with the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. George Mason's language in the Declaration of Independence, which, I mean, in the Declaration of Rights, which preceded the Declaration of Independence was strikingly similar. Some people think that Thomas Jefferson did some copying. In fact, Jefferson and Mason were doing exactly the same thing, so it's not surprising that their language resembled each other. Mason's language is that all men were born equal and entitled to life, liberty, the right to acquire property, and the right to pursue and obtain happiness and safety. I mean, he went farther than Jefferson, a right to pursue and obtain happiness and safety. Jefferson and Madison were writing political propaganda more than they were writing treatises on political theory. They were trying to persuade the political nation, adult white property owning men, to join together in an act of mass treason against their king. And then they explained why. But that language created equal. But I've, I've, I've taken to calling this the revolutionary language of liberty because this language is a kind of the mainspring that drives very much of American history. All men are created equal. Well, now those white men who didn't own property seized on that. We're entitled to vote too. We are men, we are Americans, we are American citizens. So that language of liberty drove the, uh, the, the campaign throughout the United States between the revolution and the Civil War to create universal manhood suffrage, which Virginians finally adopted in 1851, 75 years late. That same language of liberty, all men are created equal, life, liberty, uh, is at the heart of the campaign to abolish slavery early in the 19th century. You can see echoes of it. Men quoted it after the Civil War in support of the idea that freed black men should be allowed to vote. The same idea is at the heart of the woman suffrage movement early in the 20th century. And of course, the civil rights and women's movements in the middle of the 20th century. This language of liberty is really powerful stuff. We still quote it, we don't practice it, but we still quote it. Now, one thing that I saw when I was studying the constitutional history of Virginia that I had never seen or read about or heard about, and I think I can probably claim credit to discovering it, is a constitutional revolution in the 1850s and 60s. During that decade, Virginians wrote five state constitutions. You get the Constitution of 1851, the convention that we call the Secession Convention of 1861, uh, wrote a new constitution and submitted it to voters who failed to ratify it, but they wrote one, and that you could, the differences between 51 and 61 teach us a lot. Northwestern Virginians wrote a constitution for what became West Virginia in 1863. Virginians who remained loyal to the United States during the Civil War wrote a constitution in 1864 and abolished slavery, among other things. And then after the Civil War, in 1867 and 8, another convention wrote another constitution. 
a convention composed largely of men who had been loyal to the United States during the Civil War, and including among its 100 and what I think 102 members were 24 black men, the first black men who ever held public office in Virginia. And they wrote by far the most democratic constitution that Virginia had had to date. They extended the suffrage. They disfranchised Confederates who wouldn't apologize for their past and disavow their Confederate past. They required the General Assembly to create a free, a system of free public schools statewide for all children. That's about as important a thing as anybody ever did in this state. They added new provisions to the Virginia Bill of Rights, including one that said, all citizens are entitled to equal rights. They added this to the Virginia Constitution before the 14th Amendment was ratified. This was part of a you know, comprehensive um, attempt to remake the Southern slave, slave states into actual democratic polities. The Virginia Constitution that was, went into effect in 1869 resembled state constitutions in the free states very much. It was very much in step with the rest of the country. The, the number of important changes that took place in that two decade period uh, is far greater than the number of changes that took place in Virginia's fundamental law at any other time. The most important in many people's minds, of course, was enfranchising black men. That was also, of course, the most controversial, delayed the ratification referendum for more than a year. And almost from the very beginning, white political leaders who disapproved of black suffrage began fighting back. And they were good at it because they outnumbered the people who favored reform, far outnumbered the black voters. So in 1875, they ratified a constitutional amendment to impose a poll tax for the stated reason of making it too expensive for poor people to vote. Chiefly poor black people, that's who they talked about. But they also included in that constitutional revision another provision that at the time was called the chicken thief amendment. And the stated reason for doing this was to disfranchise more black voters because those white supremacists believed that black people were inherently more dishonest than white people. And that as in slavery days, they would steal food that wasn't worth anything in monetary terms, like chickens. And so they disfranchised all those people too. A slightly modified version of that clause is still in our state constitution today. We hear debates about it frequently, about restoring voting rights to people who have been convicted of, you know, some petty shoplifting. You know, you can rob a bank or kill somebody and get a long prison sentence. You can get caught shoplifting and be fined $100 or maybe six months in jail, but you also get a life sentence of disfranchisement. When you've served your sentence, you get all of your rights back. You can marry, you can own a business, you can buy a car, but you can't vote. So here is a place where something that was done with a, what I can only accurately describe as a nasty purpose is still with us. Those white supremacists succeeded in another constitutional convention held in 1901 and 2, which severely reduced the electorate, reduced the number of black voters by about 90%, with a poll tax and a complicated registration process, and just made it so complicated and difficult you couldn't hardly do anything. In fact, it permitted voter registrars to hand people a blank piece of paper when they came in to register, and the, regi the registrar was not supposed to give any instructions to that person. That person had to know everything that the Constitution and the laws required and write it down and hand it in. If they left out something or asked for help, threw it in the wastebasket. This reduced the number of white voters by about 50% also. And with a very small electorate, 
you have a long period that lasts until the mid-1960s when state politics and state government were almost entirely under the control of a very conservative, very small number of leading state Democrats. If there's anybody here in this audience who has not heard of Harry Byrd and the Byrd Organization, um, well, you need to. Harry Byrd inherited a 40-year-old political organization early in the 1920s, and he ran it until the mid-1960s. I mean, that 40 years, that was what, one-eighth of the whole history of Virginia to that date. With a small electorate, and a loyal group of followers in the legislature and in the county boards of supervisors and in city councils and in banks and in law firms, the Byrd organization was the longest lived, most dominant political ring or organization of any state in the country ever. And in part, it's the constitution of 192 that enabled that to take place. So don't tell me state constitutions are not important. The Constitution of 192 was amended in many technical ways in 1928, but in effect, it stayed in, in, in force until 1971, including all the provisions for restrictive voting and a provision that they put in to require that white and black students never attend the same school at the same time. That was in the state constitution. It remained in the state constitution for nearly 20 years after Brown versus Board of Education said that that violated the Constitution of the United States. The provisions of the Constitution of 1902 also violated several provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But they stayed in the constitution anyway. They just weren't regularly enforced. They could be informally imposed on people in some ways. But there's more revolutions coming. The Civil Rights Revolution with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and uh, abolition of the poll tax for elections of federal officials chipped away very substantially at the ability of the Byrd organization to control and limit the electorate. But at the same time, if I call this the representation revolution, you may remember there was a, a cascade of Supreme Court cases in the 1960s that basically said the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights, 14th Amendment, require that all voters have equal chance to influence the election in every legislative district, from House of Representatives to state legislature, uh, city council, school board, sanitation districts in some places are elected. And that meant that you could no longer gerrymander in the same way that they used to. In Virginia, gerrymanders had been used to make sure that the eastern, southeastern counties where the majority of the slave owners lived always had majorities in the General Assembly, even though white slaveholders in the southeastern counties were a small minority of the white people. Gerrymanders of that sort had been used to make sure that the strongholds of the bird organization in the small towns and rural areas of the state always had a majority in the general assembly even after the city after the cities became more populous than the rest of the state so the representation revolution invalidated a great many of the practices and laws that were in place in virginia under the authority of the constitution of 1902. finally that constitution was so restrictive on the actions of the state government and on the actions of the local governments that the governor in 1968 asked for authority to appoint an expert commission to recommend a new constitution. This uh, commission consisted of prominent lawyers, judges, law professors, a uh, couple of ex-governors, uh, former superintendent of public instruction, uh, former president of William and Mary, and they recommended a whole new constitution that did away entirely with all of the old segregation requirements and all of the old Jim Crow requirements and all of the limitations on voting, except if you're convicted of a crime, you get a life sentence of disfranchisement. 
this new draft constitution that the uh, commission wrote, then went to the General Assembly. They decided that they had to go to the General Assembly because the only way you could amend or change the old constitution was through the amendment process. So they, the General Assembly created what it called, and this is in uh, legislative language, they created an amendment in the form of a substitute. Strike out everything from the first word through the last word and insert and then the text of the new constitution. The General Assembly debated and made some changes to the commission's recommendation. Then after the next election, the General Assembly had to approve that exact same document a second time and then submit it to the voters for ratification or rejection. Voters ratified it in the autumn of 1970 and it went into effect in the summer of 1971. Again, Virginians took the lead in many respects. It was one of the best constitutions in the country at the time that it was ratified. It included for the first time a provision that prohibited any state government from discriminating against any person on the basis of race, religion, creed, place of national origin, or sex. That's new. That's about 50 years before the Equal Rights Amendment. Anyway, that was a big change, a very big improvement, if you ask me. The Constitution was much shorter than the old one because the old one um, had so many restrictions on the government that, you know, if the governor wanted to blow his nose three times on Tuesday instead of four times, he pretty nearly had to get a act of the legislature to allow him to do it. The, the, the Constitution sort of placed a a chokehold on the ability of governments to meet new needs of the 20th century. In the 20th century, Virginians, just like people all over the country, came to depend on the government, state, local government, federal government sometimes, to build roads, build public hospitals to provide clean air, clean water, sewage service, telephone service in many places, streetcars, schools, sporting arenas, Airport, you name it. People came to expect that the government would do these things, and the government did not have adequate power to meet the needs of the people. So this new constitution took a lot of the straitjackets out of the constitution, invested the General Assembly with discretionary authority to do many things that before it couldn't do, and prohibited the General Assembly and the local governments from discriminating on the basis of race. big improvement. The Constitution also had another innovation in it. The Constitution of 1971 has an article on conservation. It's the first of its kind in the country. It's very early in the modern environmental movement. You know, the first Earth Day was 1970, and here we have a Constitution being submitted to the voters for ratification in that very same year. This article on conservation states clearly that it is the responsibility of the government to guarantee all Virginians clean air, clean water, and access to all of the natural resources of the state for their needs and their enjoyment. That's a commitment that the people made to themselves through the Constitution for the enactment of laws by legislative bodies such as the General Assembly. So in, in, in almost every respect, the current state constitution, even though it's now 52 years old, um, is much the best we've ever had and one of the best in the country. Having said that, though, um, it's been amended like 60 some odd times in the last 52 years. But that doesn't mean that it's a bad constitution. Many of the amendments are um, really ought just to be in the form of laws because they apply to only a few people and they're not very large. Um, public consequence, like an amendment that was ratified in 2019 that uh, enlarged the authority of local governments to give tax breaks to um, families or descendants of first responders who are injured or killed doing their duties. Well, now that's important to those people, but that's not constitutionally com uh, consequential. But there are some very important ones. Uh, we passed an amendment back in the 1970s 
that required the state not to spend more money than it had, a balanced budget amendment. Adopted amendment at about the same time that created what is now called the rainy day fund, requiring the General Assembly to put a certain amount of money aside every year into a fund that it could draw on if we had a recession or for some other reason, tax revenue suddenly falls off so that you can stay within the balanced budget amendment. I mean, that that has served the uh, state well in the meantime. Another thing that they did, this was ratified uh, early in the 20th century is, uh, no, excuse me, late in the late in the 20th century, is created the, what we call the veto session of the General Assembly. Um, members of the Assembly during the 50s and 60s, 70s were introducing increasingly large numbers of bills on everything you can think of, uh, sort of overwhelmed the capacity of members of the Assembly to pay close attention to everything. And as a result, they passed a good many bills that by the time they got to the governor's office for our signature, somebody noticed, well, we already have a law on that. Or there's three bills that do nearly the same thing. Or there's two bills that contradict each other. Or they just had technical defects. And so the governor would have to veto those bills. The veto session of the assembly requires and allows the General Assembly to come back several weeks after adjournment to consider governor's vetoes, as well as amendments or changes that the governor can suggest during the interim. So this way, the legislature can actually get its job done better than it did before. I mean, no legislature is ever really very good, but they're certainly better at the getting the laws right now than they used to be. And then just four years ago, we ratified an amendment to create a redistricting commission uh, the intent here was to take some of the politics out of the poli out of the business of drawing congressional district lines and House of Delegates lines and state Senate lines in order that to make partisan gerrymandering more difficult. Well, it didn't work because the con the constitutional amendment authorized members of the General Assembly to appoint equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans to the commission, and the partisan members of the General Assembly appointed partisan political activists to that commission, which had eight Democrats and eight Republicans. They refused to work together. They drew up two plans. Neither would agree to anything in the other plan. And they failed in their constitutional responsibility to redistrict the state. Fortunately, the amendment had a safety valve in it, which stated that if the commission was unable to redistrict the state, the Supreme Court would do it. I mean, a lot of people, especially a lot of Democrats, opposed the amendment because of this safety valve, because they well, look at the Supreme Court. I mean, almost every member was appointed by a Republican legislature. Can we expect them to be fair? Well, to the credit of the judges of the Supreme Court of Virginia, they did their job fairly. They hired a respected, experienced Republican expert on redistricting, and they hired an experienced, respected Democrat expert on redistricting. And the judges told these two men, you know the law, you know the Constitution, take the numbers and do this right. And by golly, they did a really good job. The Supreme Court adjusted a few of the district boundaries uh, right here in the, in the city of Richmond in response to some public comments. And that is now the set of districts that we will be voting in in the legislative elections in November of this year and in the congressional elections in November of next year. This is the first time we've ever had district boundaries in Virginia that give us a reasonably good chance to allow the members of people, the numbers of people who live within each of those districts to elect representatives who probably fairly represent the character and the population of the district. So good thing there was a safety valve. Amendments could be amended, so it would be possible if you could get it through the General Assembly, to amend that amendment that created the Constitutional Revision Commission so that you could guarantee less partisanship. Many states have uh, judicial appointment commissions that consist of retired judges or eminent lawyers or other people who know the legal community and could suggest good judges. Could suggest 
people who would be good to serve on the redistricting commission. Take some of the partisanship out of it. You can't take all of the partisanship out of it because that's just the way it is. But partisanship drives too much of redistricting right now. So it's worth thinking about amending that amendment. Anyway, here we are, 52 years into the seventh or eighth state constitution in Virginia. It's still a good one. It still works, even though we amend it from time to time. But look how so much things have changed, not only in the population and in the political culture and in the law, but in how we change constitutions. Elected Virginians wrote constitutions in 1776, 1830, 1851, 1864, 1869, and 1901 and two. Since 1901, Virginians have not elected a constitutional convention. All of the changes have come out of the General Assembly in the form of constitutional amendments, or in 1928 and 1971, in the form of amendments, in the form of a substitute for the whole document. So we do not any longer have the kind of robust public con con uh, comment periods or conversations before conventions that we had from 1776 to 1901. That public debate is not there anymore about the nature of representative democracy and how to structure the institutions and practices of government in a changing world. Now it's the General Assembly that suggests changes. We have a right to accept them or reject them, but the General Assembly is in the driver's seat and has been now for more than a hundred years. We haven't paid much attention to the implications of that because Constitutional government in the United States has been premised on the fact that the federal and state constitutions are the expressed will of the people in their sovereign capacity. Authorizing institutions of government to do certain things and prohibiting them from doing others. But since 1910, when the General Assembly proposed the first amendments to the Constitution of 1902, only the General Assembly has decided what kinds of amendments we could consider. That is a kind of a hidden augmentation of the actual power of the General Assembly of Virginia. What does that, I don't know what that means. It's not been much noticed, but it may be really very important. In short, the story ain't over. The story ain't over. I think I've used up most of my time. Um, we have time for some questions, which I will be glad to try to answer. Um, this is being recorded. So if you have a question, please signal one of the people in the room. Uh, it's, Ashley is in the back. She has a microphone so that the people who, if anybody, who, who watch this on the library's website can hear what the question is too. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is in the constitution. I think it is, but the, um... The independent city uh, arrangement in um, the Commonwealth, uh, when did that come about and why? Independent cities are not mentioned in the Constitution. Oh. I looked for it because I wondered about that too. I mean, Virginia is unique in that. I think there's only two cities in the United States that are outside of Virginia and that are not in a county and within the jurisdiction of a county. But in Virginia, all of the incorporated cities are completely independent of counties in the same way that all of the counties are independent of each other. Nobody planned it. Nobody thought it was a good idea. It just happened. There's a long series of laws beginning at the time of the revolution and going all the way into the late 19th century that one by one gave this city or that city or the other city the authority to do something that the adjacent county government did. By the middle of the 19th century, every incorporated city had its own judges in the same way that every county had its own judges. Many of them had their own deed and will books that were traditionally the responsibility of counties. 
one after another of these things, you know, they prohibited counties from levying a tax on residents of a city because the city governments levered taxes on that. These just accumulated so that by the beginning of the 20th century, the state Supreme Court recognized that no county government had any authority within the boundaries of a city. We call these independent cities, but that phrase does not occur in Virginia constitutions, even though it is uh, treated with as if it has constitutional authority. The constitutions sort of silently recognize that. So, you know, people ask all the time, why did they do this? Well, they did try. There's not a reason it just happened, but they recognized that it had happened. And boy, try to explain to a newcomer to Virginia or to someone from out of state that the city of Charlottesville is not in Albemarle County, even though it's completely surrounded by it. Just, it it's hopeless. It's hopeless. You know, independent cities grew up just like Topsy and Uncle Tom's cabin. A good question, though. Anybody else? Yeah. Related, as I recall, there's no mention whatsoever of county governments in the Constitution of 1776. Or of the Church of England, which was a part of the government before and after. Right, right. Which I, which that I puzzled me. To be an indication of just, as you were suggest, suggesting, how, how conservative that document was in terms of enshrining the status quo of, right. of Virginia's constitutional order. Uh, and and also how powerful the oligarchies of the counties were. That it does, that it does. In fact, none of the revolutionary period constitutions has much to say about local government. They were concerned about getting the influence of the king out of their governments. They guarded against the king after they decided they weren't going to have one. So most of the provisions of the early state constitutions that concerned the governor, the legislature, and the court system. Some of them concerned the militia. You can almost see the county governments in the Constitution of 1776 because it makes a passing mention to sheriffs, clerks of court, um, justices of the peace, and coroners. Well, those are county officials. Elsewhere, in a separate ordinance that that convention passed after it adopted the Constitution, it said all the laws of Virginia now in force that are consistent with this Constitution you can shall stay in force. Well, now that included all the laws that authorized the county courts to lay taxes. They approved taxation without representation in that ordinance. And the authority that the laws gave justices of the peace and sheriffs and coroners. So basically they smuggled the county government into the constitution by mentioning those four officials. They didn't mention the Church of England at all, but the Church of England retained constitutional status until the General Assembly adopted the Statute for Religious Freedom in 1786. That law was always treated as if it had constitutional status up until 1869 when they put it into the state constitution. So yeah, there are things that, if you look for them in the constitution, they're not there. But the county government survived and independent cities arose. So you have to look more at more things than just the Constitution. That's something I learned. I'd always wondered about the counties and about the independent cities. And I think I now know. Yes, sir. Uh, the microphone? Yeah. Uh, what effect did Bacon's rebellion have on the Constitution? Just about none. Bacon's Rebellion of 1776, for those of you who are not familiar with it, was an uprising of middle and lower class white Virginia men against some of the institutions and practices of royal and local government in Virginia. And uh, it was actually sparked by uh, conflicts with Indians on the frontier. Some of the First Nations tribes on the frontier um, were at war with each other, and some of them were trying to restrict or prohibit the movement of more English settlers into their hunting grounds. And a whole bunch of 
events conspired at about the same time to allow an uprising of these lower and middle class white men in the counties, um, they, in effect, they rebelled. Uh, the governor had to flee uh, Jamestown and go over to the eastern shore, and he had a pretty full-scale war there for a few weeks. And the British sent over a fleet and a small army and suppressed the rebellion. The rebellion collapsed, left hard feelings for many years, but it didn't change anything in the way in which the government operated. So in that respect, there's no constitutional change. Now, some people say, well, there was no constitution because after the abolition of the uh, of the charter of the Virginia Company in 1624, there was no one document that explained anything about how the government was to work or what the relationship between the government and the people of Virginia was with their king. The constitution of the colony, on which I have a whole chapter, is the collection of all of the institutions and practices that arose in Virginia to meet people's needs. The king accepted them, the people accepted them. They stayed in effect for so long that according to a maximum of the common law, they'd been in effect for so long that the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. That was the constitution of Virginia and nothing about that changed as a direct consequence of Bacon's rebellion. You know about Bacon's rebellion, you're in the minority. Uh, the question back here. It seems to me you, you might have um, entitled your book The Eccentric Constitution of Virginia. I mean, there's some peculiarities. Obviously, the one-term governor is, is a peculiar thing. One uh, aspect of it that's always struck me is as bizarre is having the legislature elect the judges. And it's only Virginia and South Carolina that follow that practice. And when I would raise it with, with my... Virginia law, your friends, they, you know, they thought, well, the, the alternatives, popular election of the judges, for example, or gubernatorial appointment are even worse. But, and then when I would say, but what about checks and balances? I mean, if you have a judiciary chosen by the legislature for limited terms, and the judges have to go before the courts of justice committee to get reappointed. And about every 20 years, they'll shoot one just to set an example for the other. <laughs> Doesn't that lead to a very deferential attitude toward the enactments of the legislature? And you pointed out that they were elected as late as uh, 1850, right? Right. They elected all, all the judges until 1851. An 1851 constitution authorized voters to elect the judges, but the constitution of 1864 took that out and election of judges went back to the General Assembly and has been there ever since. Well, what impact, if any, do you think that that decision uh, has had on the uh, this undemocratic trend in Virginia history? We well, you know this is currently an object of public discussion because the General Assembly elects judges of courts, but it also elects the judges of the State Corporation Commission. Right now, with Republicans in control of the House, very partisan control, Democrats in very partisan control of the Senate, they have been unable to agree on who to appoint to fill vacancies. So now the three-member uh, State Corporation Commission has one judge this is a failure of the General Assembly to exercise its responsibilities responsibly. I think that we ought to think about different ways to select judges. Other states are, have been able to take some of the partisanship out and involve a larger community uh, in the uh, identification of judges. You know, you could have the governor appoint a judge subject to some confirmation by the state Senate. There's any number of ways that you could do this. But this limit on the terms of the governor and this General Assembly appointment of judges is a legacy of the Constitution of 1776. I think it ought to be revisited. It's worth thinking about this. In the same way it's worth thinking about uh, how convicted felons can be restored to the suffrage, which should, which shouldn't, and how. Um, partisanship is playing entirely too large a role in everything right now. And these constitutional provisions that allow 
the General Assembly to elect judges and nobody else to have a say uh, are probably injurious. Good question from the Emeritus Dean of the University of Richmond School of Law. Well, I thank you again for coming. And, you know, I, I, I learned long ago that if I give a talk, nobody snores and somebody asks a good question, it was probably okay. But anyway, thank you.